PC, accounting for your future. Hi, this is Steve from APC, and I'm the course director here at APC. And in this video, we are going to be starting to look at the International Accounting Standards number 19, Employees Benefit. So, what do I mean by employees benefit? Think about it this way: you are the boss of the company. You want to motivate the employees within the company, or maybe you're going to attract the employees to work for you. So, how are you going to do it? One of the key elements uh, for you to do is to give the benefit to the employees, including the salary, the bonuses, etc. But the question is, from the accountant's point of view, how are we going to account for it? So that's very, very important, isn't it? So the simple idea behind it is that, for example, for the basic salary, bonuses, uh, which means if you reach the sales revenue of $1 million, I'm going to give you 10% of that $1 million as the bonus to you at the year of end. Also, I'm going to give you some kind of uh, things like benefits. For example, I'm going to provide you with the monetary benefit, I'm going to give you money, or maybe I'm, I'm going to provide you with the non-monetary uh, benefits, such as the dental care service to you, it's the free service to you, free of charge. And if that is the case, of course, that costs me money from a company's point of view. The question is how we're going to account for it. So from the accountant's point of view, we're going to debit the expense, or we can call it the PNL, for example, the salary expense, the bonuses expense, etc. And then we're going to credit the liability if we haven't paid for it. But if we do have paid for it, what we need to do is we're going to credit the cash paid. So that's how we're going to account for it. So you may have a question, well, Steve, why do we need to debit the PNL? Well, the answer for that is the PNL figure will be ultimately brought forward to the equity section of your SFP. So, in other words, you debit the expense, you increase the expense up. That, in effect, is to decrease the equity down. So, decrease the equity because you increase your liability, okay, in the bottom of the accounting journal. So, that's how you account for it. For example, you said to that employee, you work for me, I'm going to give you $10 as the basic salary plus the bonuses. How are we going to account for it? So what we need to do is where we're going to debit the expense of 10 and credit the liability with regards to salary as well as the bonuses worth of 10. If we have paid for by cash, of course what we need to do is we're going to remove that liability by debiting the liability of 10 and credit the cash paid of 10. That's how we're going to account for it. Of course, under the IS number 19, there would be the long-term benefit as well. This happens quite a lot, especially for the top management within the company. So what the company actually does is to retain those staff to work for it and to motivate them to work within this company, such as the CEO. So instead of giving them just the basic salary, I'm going to give them shares. I'm going to give them share options. It's the option to buy the shares or sell the shares at some point in time. So the benefit to those is that because, you can think about it this way, because according to P1 of your study, we know the agency theory, we know the agency problem because of the separation of the ownership and the actual operation of the businesses. And from the shareholders' perspective, what we need to do is we're going to make the CEO think that they are the owner of this company. So how we're going to do it is I'm going to give them shares so that they can share the profits that they uh, that the company earn, okay, uh, as a proportion of their income so that we can motivate them. So how are we going to account for it? This will be detailed and expand under the I forward number two, is the share-based payments. So share-based payments is not that difficult at all. So what we need to do is that we're going to give them shares. How are we going to do it? Is we're going to debit the expense and we're going to credit the equity or cash paid, depending upon which scheme that you have. 
So we're going to detail that into the other parts of the material, but trust me, that is not difficult at all, because the basic idea is we're going to debit expense or equity, and we're going to credit the liability up. But the key thing about the IS number 19 is related to pension accounting. So for you and I, we know that human beings have to die, have to get older, and if they get older, of course, maybe uh, they cannot work in the, in the marketplace quite efficiently than they uh, have worked before when they were young. So what we need to do is that, well, if we want to motivate as well as retaining the staff working with us, not only I'm going to give them shares, not only I'm going to give them salary, but I have to make sure that after they retire, they work for us and they retire, we can give them some benefits. That's called the pension. We can give them some money in order for them to have this money on hand and uh, have a good day uh, when they retire. So as a result of it, how are we going to account for it from the accountant's point of view? Because what the accountant is going to do is to provide the useful information to the users, such as the shareholders, in order for them to make their decisions. So for example, if I'm going to account for the pension, of course that's the expense to the company, and that will also be a liability to the company. And if that is the case, of course, I'm a shareholder, I haven't purchased your shares, but if I obtain your financial statement, I can see that the pension liability is worth at $10 billion but your asset will be complete just to be $1. If that is the case, should I buy your shares? Maybe the answer for that is no, because after I've bought your shares, maybe you will use my money just to pay off the employees rather than investing somewhere else. So from the accountant's point of view, we have to make sure that the disclosure of the pension, especially for the assets worth liabilities, are absolutely correct. If this is not the case, of course, it will scare the shareholders, for example, and that is not a good thing. So, before we dip into the detailed accounting of the pension, what we need to do is that we need to understand what type of pension scheme that there are uh, within the marketplace. So basically, we have got two types of pension scheme. So we've got the defined contribution scheme and we've got the defined benefit scheme. But the question is, what are the differences between these two? So firstly, uh, let's look at the screen over there and we are going to draw a picture to see what are the differences between these two. So we got a company here and we've got the final employee there. So firstly, let's have a look at the defined contribution scheme to see how this works. So this means that the company will say to the employee, well, after you retire, you will get the lump sum of money, but how much? I don't know. My responsibility is that I'm going to pay the money to a trustee in each and every year. For example, for a fixed amount of $300 per month. So I'm going to pay for it and my job's done. And it's up to the trustee to invest your money, invest this $300 in each and every month into buying shares, buying bonds, and doing some other investments as well. So if they've got money after retire, for example, after 20 years, because we use this money to buy the shares and I can get the return from a trustee's perspective, I can get a return, for example, I can get a return of $2,000 so that I can distribute this $2,000 to you. But how much you will receive, this is not fixed. It's entirely up to the investment whether or not it succeed or not in the future. As a result of it, 
Let's look at the company because we are the company's accountants. How are we going to account for this defined contribution scheme in our company's FS? So what we need to do is that, well, because we've set total liability after we make the payment to trustee each and every month. So what we need to do is where we're going to debit the expense and credit the cash paid. If we haven't paid by cash of this $300, what we need to do is we're going to credit the liability up and when we set to buy cash later on we're going to debit the liability to remove it and we're going to credit the cash paid that is just to be the same as what we've seen in the previous of accounting journals so why do we do that well the reason behind it is because if you think about the definition of the liability it is the present obligation arising for past events which means we sign a contract with the employee that we give a lump sum of money to the trustee each and every month and our liability settled. So it's the present obligation because we sign a contract from past event because we've signed it and from which the future economic benefit will flow out from the company. So as you can see, $300 from flowing out from the company as a result of this contract being signed, as a result of it, after we've fulfilled the contract, we've set to the liability so that we have nothing left so we do not have to show the asset as well as the liability in our account but the asset as well as the liability ownership will be remaining into the trustees account you agree so what we need to do from our perspective is where we simply debit the expense and credit the cash paid so that's what i mean by defined contribution scheme this means so let me just write down here. So defined contribution scheme means the money put into the trustee in each month is defined or defined, which means fixed but the total amount of money that the employee can receive after they retire is not defined it's entirely up to the investments that we've made before so that's the first of our scheme which is the defined contribution scheme hope you are happy with that so let's say the second of our scheme within the syllabus is the defined benefit scheme so looking at the screen again so let's see how we're going to draw a picture to show this transaction so we have got a company here and we've got the employees there and of, of course somewhere in the middle we've got the trustee as well which is a company that's obtained your investment and invested somewhere else so for a defined benefit scheme what we are saying here is that the company will agree to the employee that after you retire after 20 years after you retire I'm going to give you a lump sum of money for five million dollars. So the final benefit is defined. The final benefit is fixed at the time we sign the contract. So in order to make sure that we've got this five million dollars to be distributed to the employee, what we need to do is that we need to consider the inflation. We cannot simply retain this five million dollars into our company's account because by doing so you know that time value of money that you've studied into f9 as well as the p4 because of the inflation the five million dollars right now may be worth at one million dollars after 20 years so we are afraid of that so from a company's point of view what we need to do is where we're going to invest the fixed amount of money into the trustee each and every year and it's up to the trustee to help us to operate this money in order to grow it up to $5 million in 20 years time. It's up to the trustee to invest my money into shares, into bonds and other investments as well, making sure that in 20 years that the money will grow to $5 million can be distributed to the final employee. So that is the defined benefit scheme so we know how it works the question for that is from the accountant's point of view 
how are we going to account for it? That's the difficult question, as you can see. Because, for example, the contract itself is related to 20 years. It's related to this $5 million in 20 years after they retire. This means that in the current year, we haven't fulfilled our contract yet. And as a result of it, we remain the liability. We can't de-recognize it as what we've seen in the defined contribution scheme. Or, you know, although we've got, I mean, we've made the payment to the trustee, but we can't simply de-recognize the liability because we haven't fulfilled the contract yet. So what we need to do from the accountant's point of view is that for the company, we need to show the pension asset as well as the liability. Because as you can see, if I invest uh, one million dollars into the trustee, but in the second year, that's the trustee has made the loss. Because investments, we cannot guarantee 100% of success. So if they make a loss of you know turning the one million dollars to five hundred thousand dollars only. If that is the case, of course, what we need to do from the accountant's point, from the company's point of view, we have to make up that deficit. So what we need to do is we're going to invest another five hundred million dollars, uh, five hundred thousand dollars, in order to make up that deficit, in order to, I mean, make sure that one million dollars turns to five million dollars. As a result of it, this asset as well as the liability, not it's not remaining to a trustee's account. It's remaining within our company's accounts. The risk and rewards of them have not been transferred from a company to a trustee. So what we need to do in our, in our company's account, we need to show the pension asset as well as the pension liabilities. But the question for that is how we are going to do this then. So what we need to do from the accountant's point of view is what we're going to show that in the disclosure part of your financial statements. So according to the IAS number 19, what we need to do is that we're going to provide the understandable information to the user. So understandable information is one of the elements of the qualitative characteristics within your conceptual framework. So how can this be understandable? What we need to do is what we're going to disclose the separate asset as well as the liability with regards to pension. So what we need to do is that, for example, we've got the opening balance of the pension asset as well as the liability. So for example, is to be $10 and, let's say, uh, $5 here. So, I mean, what does that actually mean is, for example, the pension liabilities, the liability we owe to those uh, employees that is going to be retired, the pension asset is related to the investment into shares, into bonds and other investments. So what we need to do is we're going to use this asset to cover up the liability. Use this asset to pay off the liability. But this asset remains in, in the trustee's account, but the risks and rewards remain within our company. So that's why we're going to show that, show the assets was the liability in our account. But those assets was the liability, we need to account for its inflation, for example. So for the asset, we're going to account for the return on the asset. That's the opening balance as well. So the return on the asset, for example, the discount rate, uh, showing the inflation rate, is to be 10%. So 10% of inflation, 10% of discount rate, we're going to times the 10, which is the opening balance of the asset that will gives us one that's the return on the asset of course we're going to show that return onto the PL, which is the profit loss statement for the liabilities then of course the liability needs to be accrued in each and every year to account for its inflation for example this will be shown as the interest expense or finance cost if you prefer again we're going to use the discount rate of 10 percent times $5 of the opening liability, and that would give us 0.5. So that's the second bit. And third bit, what we need to do from the accountant's point of view, 
we have to show because the company is going to make a fixed amount of payment to the trustee in each and every year to make sure that the, that, that the pension asset is not running as a deficit. So what we need to do is we're going to account for the contribution into the pension asset. So contribution into the pension asset, for example, we're going to uh, give them $5 here. Okay, we're going to make another payment by the company into making sure that the trustee can use this money to invest in shares, invest in bonds and other investments, contribution into the scheme. But for the liability on the other hand, we also need to show the service costs. So service costs would relate to quite a lot of things. So for example, if the new employee coming into a company, we have to show how much benefits we're going to provide it for after they retire. This will be included into the service costs. And also for those existing employees, we're going to change our pension scheme and we're going to say to them, well, because you worked for me for quite a long time, for example, 20 years, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide to pay for you more pension money. Instead of paying you $10, I'm going to give you $12. As a result of that, another $2 will be provided as the service cost. So for example, in this case, we're going to provide two here. And then not only for that, but also for those, I mean, for those employees who is going to retire in the current year, we're going to show that as the benefits out. For example, three dollars. You may have a question. Well, Steve, why do we show three in both sides? I said to you, what we need to do is where we're going to use this asset to cover the liability. And what we need to do is where we debit the pension liability three to reduce it. And at the same side, we're going to credit the pension asset of three to reduce it as well. And then what we need to do then is where we have got the expected closing figure and we expect the pension asset to be 10 plus 11 plus 5 16 minus 3 which will give us 13 and then for liability 5 plus 0.5, 5.5, plus 2, 7.5, minus 3, 4.5. We expect this to be this. But you know that from an early study, we have learned the fair value measurement, and uh, I mean, the fair value measurement according to IFRS number 13 will be determined in three levels. Yes? So what the company should do is that, well, you do your calculation fine, but those calculations are just to be simple. It does not reflect quite a lot of things. So for example, the volatility of the cash flows, the option values, etc. So what we need to do is, where we, from a company's point of view, is where we're going to employ the naturi. So that's the, another person here, called actuary. This is a person who is specialised into the sophisticated calculations and the company will ask the actuary in each and every year saying to them, well, I want to have $5 million to be paid to the final employee but uh, I've just made $1 million here and how much money should I put into the company? Whether or not I can get the gain or losses in the current year's investment so the actuary will use quite a lot of his techniques, such as the black souls option pricing model, etc., to calculate the value of this of, the, of those investments to see whether or not I have made a gain or ha or I have suffered a loss as a result of it. So from this perspective, then the actuary will provide us with his own ex expert figure. So the actual closing is given by the actuary. is to be 16 here and this will be 5 here here so as a result of it we calculate to be 13 but he calculated as 16 so what we need to do is we're going to provide another 3 as the actual variable gains losses 
or we can call it as the remeasurement components nowadays. This would be uh, presented into the OCIs, the other comprehensive income into the PL and OCI. So 3 here and this will be 0 0.5 here. So that's how we deal with the defined benefit scheme. But the question for that is, well, Steve, it's relatively complicated, isn't it? But uh, uh, how are we going to do the journals related to each of those? So let's look at the left hand side. Uh, let's have a look at the screen and let's see how we're going to do the accounting journals step by step. So firstly, we've got the return asset. So what we need to do is where we're going to debit the asset up. Are we going to credit the income? Or we can call it as the PL, as the uh, income from the pension. So that's to do one. But for the interest costs, what we need to do is where we go to because we increase liability and we debit the expense and credit the liability up. Okay. What about for the contribution in to the scheme? Because it adds up to the asset. So what we need to do is where we debit the pension asset up of five because we put our five dollars into the pension asset and we credit the cash paid because we pay by cash. So this is the only cash element that you need to understand within the defined benefit scheme. So this would be, the $5 would be the only item, only the cash item to present it into a statement of cash flow. All of other items would be the non-cash adjustment. The service cost then is where we debit the p and and we credit the liability up by another two. And for the benefits out, which is the money we paid to those people within a couple of places going to retire this year, what we need to do is we debit the pension liability to remove it, and we're going to credit the assets down by three as well. So those will be the uh, both sides of the accounting journals. So what about for the other three as well as five? So what we need to do is where we're going to debit for example, the three is where we're going to debit the asset and we credit the OCI of three. And then for the 0 0.5 here is where we're going to debit the PL, uh, sorry, debit the OCI uh, expense and we're going to credit the liability up by 0 0.5 as well. So those are the things that we're going to show in the accounting journals. The question is, because this is just to be a disclosure requirements uh, for the uh, for the for the default benefit scheme but how we're going to show that into the actual financial statement then so in the actual financial statement we are going to show firstly within this statement of profit loss and OCI so under the realized income expense we're going to show The return asset, the interest expense, or we can call it as the unwinding costs or finance costs if you prefer. Also, we're going to show the service cost as well. So, in this case, so we're going to show one, not 0.5, as well as two. So, one, not 0.5, and so because the costs. Uh, we're going to show that as the positive, so the expense and the return, of course, is opposite against the expense, so that is negative. So, total them up, it will give us 1.5 to be shown in the PL as the expense, net not. Also, for the OCI, then, we're going to show. The remeasurement components and the remeasurement components as you can see we have got three and five so because we create the OCI of three and we debit the expense of 0 0.5 so we're going to net them off it will give us 2.5 so three minus 0 0.5 gives us 2.5 
are also on the SF pay with the statements of financial position. We're going to show the net pension asset or liability. And in this case, it's the net pension asset, as you can see, is to be 16 minus 5, which will give us 11. That's how we do it. One final point before we leave this section is that for the net pension asset is 11, we cannot carry this asset value too high according to our Kruger's concept because we have to be careful. So as a result of it, the Iceland 19 has introduced the concept of the asset savings. So we need to be able to know that the asset savings is the same as what we've seen in the Iceland 36 in payment of asset as the recoverable amount. We cannot carry this value too high, exceeding that, uh, exceeding that recoverable amount. Of course, I'm going to show you how to account for it in a later course. Okay, so that's the end of the IS-19 introduction for the employee's benefit. Of course, in the later sections, we're going to practice more questions as well as explain more concepts within your syllabus as well. Thank you. APC, accounting for your future.